Hello everyone, this is the third episode of The OC Show with Tim and uh, me, Peter. And today we're going to talk about uh, Computex 2014 with the G-Skill OC World Cup and the uh, HWL OC Anniversary Gathering. And then we also have a small talk with uh, Elmore, who's sitting uh, right next to us here. Yep. But uh, first of all, Computex 2014. Yeah, so I guess uh, Compute Computex this year is going to be uh, very much like the last year's. If not maybe bigger, we don't know really yet, but it's going to be uh, approximately 40 to 50 overclockers joining in, including uh, overclocking related media from different countries to cover all the events that are planned and going to happen at Computex. Yeah, I think the total amount of people or overclockers joining Computex this year is going to be similar to last year, which was about 50. Okay. And um, last year was actually the first time Computex was really, really big for, for overclockers. Yeah, yeah, last year. Last year there were several events, like there was the Corsair event, the Galaxy event, just your booth with five or six overclockers on stage. Asrock had also. Asrock had something. Um, and after that, like uh, there was also the usual vendors having in-house events, like uh, inviting uh, privately overclockers to yeah. come over in their labs, such as Gigabyte and SI did that, and uh, Asus as well. I think if the, if the viewers want to see um, what it was like last year, uh, you guys made a recap video with Overclock yeah. TV. Yeah, we went around the, all the different booths and uh, pretty much made a, a mashup of everything that happened. So I guess, I guess it's going to give you a good idea of what's going to be Computex like this year. Yeah, so today we're April 1st, which is about two months away from uh, Computex. So a lot of the events are still up in the air. It's not yes. that much confirmed yet. Um, I think the biggest one that is confirmed so far is the G, G sorry G Skill OC World Cup, yeah. um, which has a ten thousand US dollar prize for the winner of the competition. This is probably the the biggest prize for the top position in a overclocking competition. Not, not probably, it's okay, like for sure. Right. So it's the highest price, uh, cash prize yeah. for a single overclocker ever in a live overclocking competition. But there's no price for the second and third position. So no. Basically and the money that other competition would have allocated to the second and third is all transferred to the first. Yeah, where usually you'd see a distribution, uh, for example, 5,000 for yes. the winner and then 3,000 for second place and uh, 2,000 for third place. Mm. Now all that cash is merged into one big yeah. head prize. And another twist in this story is that you have to fly yourself into uh, Computex. Yeah, so, so there's no qualifier with golden tickets to come no. to the finals. No. There's not going to be like, okay, we're going to fly in 10 other clubs. Mm -hmm. You fly in by yourself, you have to qualify by yourself. And then you have to compete, well, not pretty much by yourself, but you have to pick the hardware vendor you want to use for your motherboard, mm -hmm. graphics card, and uh, yeah. So as far as we can see, um, because the, the, the live aspect of the competition hasn't fully been confirmed yet, mm. there's going to be a part where you can use your own hardware um, for yeah. competing, which, um, which allows you to kind of um, invest or not invest in your own overclocking abilities. If you think, okay, my hardware, I know my hardware well enough to participate in this competition, you can invest a thousand US dollars or 1500 US dollars to fly into Computex and try and compete for the 10,000 US yeah. dollars. Well, it's also um, the people through the qualifiers will already get a good idea of what, what the gear they have at home and already have for the qualifiers is capable of compared to the yeah. one of the other competitors. So once, they, if they get qualified, then they, can, they have this extra room for either investing in more hardware or just keeping the same and being confident, or if not, being clever about it and maybe um, get support from hardware manufacturers that would be okay to support someone that aims at a top spot at Computex. It's, right? the, it's the first time that a, a competition, an overclocking competition, required participants to fly in themselves. So in that, in that regard, it's a, it's a level up. I, I think from the other other competitions, um, but it it brings a lot more stress for the yeah. participants for sure. Yeah, it's a it's a commitment on both sides. On first on the side of the competitor by himself that has to well take it very responsibly because now you invest a lot of money into into getting there, into qualifying and competing, yeah. flying over, and then you still have to win if we want to make your money back. If not, you're not. Well, you know, if you fly in and you don't win the ten thousand US dollar, you can al always join us in the HWOC anniversary that's gathering, it, right? Yeah. So, so that's going to happen uh, at the end of Computex. So yeah. it will basically start on the sixth, which is the pre prior last day of Computex. Yeah. And uh, because on the last day it's open to the public, so it's never really interesting. It's like no. just big crowds, so no one usually 
spends that much time on yeah, the so show floor. On, on the 6th you'll be able to go to the venue yeah. and then drop off your gear and then you can still go to actually check out the, the G-Skill uh, big final which is going to be held on the 6th. Yeah, yeah. And then on the 7th, 8th and 9th you can uh, join us and, uh, in the Maker Bar which is very close to the Guanghua computer market. Yeah. So the Maker Bar is basically, uh, it's a quite huge venue. I don't know how many square meters, probably nearly a hundred. Mm -hmm. um, so there will be approximately 1,000 meters plus of LN2. Whatever, how much we need. Yeah, right? there's tables, everything needed. There's a small kitchen for people that want to make food or have drinks there. Um, there's also lockers, so people that have valuable gear like CPUs or expensive stuff they don't want to leave on the table overnight, for example, they can leave it in the lockers or they try to take it back to the hotel. So it's very, very convenient place, yeah. Yeah, we, we invite everyone to, to come and join the fa yeah. facilities, right? Uh, yeah. Maybe it's important to tell what we're actually celebrating. Um, HWL <laughs> is going to be 10 years uh, in coming May, yep. uh, of which five years professional, and uh, we're also going to hit 1 million submissions this year. So a couple of big um, landmarks, yeah. landmarks, good uh, reason milestones. To, good reason to celebrate, word. right? Yeah, exactly. So throughout the weekend, there's going to be liquid nitrogen, there's going to be overclocking, there's going to be food, there's going to be a couple of drinks. Um, yeah. Just come and join if you want to. So there's uh, 50 um, spots for overclockers to participate. So there's uh, 30 bench spots yeah, 30 and bench 50 spots, spots for, yeah. for visitors. Because, I mean, the, the venue is big, but not so big that we can kind of accommodate yeah, yeah, all yeah. visitors, right? So. It's, it's important to pre-register yeah, for the event. To secure a spot. Yeah. And even if you come as a visitor, I think it's important to just let us know you're yeah. coming. Like that, we know. We don't need to stay the whole time, but just pop in. Yeah, for sure. It's, a, it's more of a community event. There's not that much stress. It's basically just hanging out with the overclockers. That's it, yeah. Um, Big networking. Yeah. So I, I guess we have to have a talk with the person here on my left, Elmore Jan, who is back in Taiwan after a... Well, a trip through Berlin, I, I think. That's great, yeah. <laughs> so what did you do in Berlin exactly? Uh, pretty much finishing up my studies. So I um, have like my diploma now. So uh, I came back here and yeah, pretty much uh, I look to, to work in this industry here in Taiwan. Yeah. The, the PC, DIY industry, motherboard, me uh, memory vendors, graphic cards, right. whatever so, comes up. Well, I did some work previously with MSI, uh, but it was still... Um, kind of on the sign line, like my main focus was still my studies, so uh -huh. I did some part-time work, uh, mostly just testing and debugging, so um, right now I'm looking to get more into actual like product development. Well, um, I think actually before we talk about your next job, um, maybe let's talk about your EVC, the really tiny device that you use yeah. for, for overclocking, which is a, a personal project I assume. That's so how, how did it get yeah. started? To That's something I came up with while I was actually working at MSI. Um, and they actually they use some, um, they have some internal tools for tuning the VRM. Um, so most of the VRM controls today, they're, like, they're digital, right? They, you can control voltages, uh, current, uh, like overcurrent protection, stuff like that. Uh, you can control this uh, through a digital interface, usually through uh, I2C or like SMBus interface. Um, and they have some internal tools for, for doing this. And uh, I figured like, why, why not make this available to the public as well? So it's, it's not too complicated um, to create such a device. So we've seen it's just like a sim sim simpler way of, uh, of doing this. We, we saw on, on, the, on the forums that you sold a couple of devices and you got some feedback from the community. What is the, what is the biggest um, problem uh, the, the, big, the biggest problem is uh, that a lot of, like, well, actually all of these uh, VRM controllers, they're, they're proprietary. They're, uh, usually the data sheets are not available uh, to the public. They're mm -hmm. just available to engineers in, in the companies who actually employ these uh, designs. Um, so through MSI, I was able to um, get some data sheets for some of these controllers uh, to actually have support to change voltages and, and like do readouts and stuff like that. Um, but right now the, the biggest problem is uh, to add like uh, support for uh, further. Do you get a lot of help from the community for adding support or is it something that you just uh, have to there, do yourself? There's, there's some, yeah. Uh, so some people, like most people actually, will, will buy the device because they have some card which is maybe a little bit difficult to do a, a regular uh, 
like feedback mod or mm -hmm. something like that. Like for example, you have a limit for the over voltage, yeah. which will be triggered if you uh, do a normal feedback mod. Typically, around like 300 millivolts over. The yeah, that's what standard. The 300 to 350 is yeah. the issue. Yeah, and by by setting the voltage through the EVC, you have, like set it the proper way designed by the manufacturer, so you won't trigger the the over voltage protection. So, so how hard is it for people that have the supported card to uh, get back to you? What do they need to do to get back to you and get a? So there's like some ways, right? Like um, if you don't have the data sheet, you can still kind of like reverse engineer it. You can do a scan of the of the bus, so you can find like some devices, and then you can try some uh, like standard methods to try to set the voltage. Like for example, if you have uh, just a different model number. Usually, the way you set the voltage is still the same. It's just, yeah. just like, just like a spin-off of the same product. Um, so usually, this will, this will do the trick. Okay, that's the most difficult way or the easiest way. Uh, of course, it's, it's it's a lot easier if you have the data sheet. Yeah. Okay. Um, and is it is it is it easy to get those data sheets, or? Um, it depends. Like. Because when I was at MSI, there's, um, you have some association, so then it's easier because, like, I can't spread the data sheets and stuff like that, right? But I can, like, I can provide the uh, the information and so I can use it for for this purpose. Um, but if, I, for example, if I want to add support for another vendor, uh, typically they they won't just send me the data sheets. Yeah. Yeah. That is indeed a big Some problem. Some kind of R and D secret. How how has the industry in general responded to the EVC? Um, there's been there's been some interest in like creating products and stuff like that, uh, like employing it uh, for their own purpose. Um, but I wanted to keep it independent because you have you have things like uh, like Nvidia Greenlight program stuff like this, and. As we know, like actually, at EVJ they had to stop selling the EVBot because Nvidia just said no, you can't do this. Well, they they didn't have to stop selling it, but they had to remove the connector from the from the card. From the card yeah. Yeah. Well, yeah, well, essentially the <laughs> it's same, it, yeah, it's essentially the same thing, the yeah. same, same um, result, right? So uh, by keeping this independent, uh, not associated with a, like any company actually selling products from Nvidia or AMD, you, you don't have this problem. Yeah, that's correct. Mm. So Nvidia hasn't sent you an email, like an angry <laughs> letter yet. No, Please stop not, doing not, this. Not, not yet. Not yet. <laughs> um, so, what is um, the most successful project right now with EVC? Because a lot of a lot of um, um, high-end cards already have either the modifications out in a in a in a, in a Word document, like um, Asus usually does, or you have the MSI Afterburner Extreme, or you have you have Kingpin leak in his OC biases for his Kingpin Edition card as well. So. There's uh, alternatives already on the market. Yeah. What card does, is the EVC most useful for? Um, in most cases, yeah, you don't need the, the EVC. Um, you can still do traditional voltage modifications mm -hmm. and things like this. Uh, but I think so far, there was a lot of success with the HD7790, mm -hmm. uh, which employed a, a, um, a new controller and a new way of setting the voltage designed by AMD called SV2. Mm -hmm. So it's like setting, it's like VID, but it's using serial um, interface for this. So you can't do like a VID modification anymore. Um, and through this method, it was actually possible to, to get like really good results. I was working together with uh, James Youngpro. Yeah. Uh, and he could show some really good um, progress with this card, like really high, I think around 1800 megahertz actually yeah. on, this, oh, on, this, on this card. Pretty interesting, yeah, pretty high. Um, so what's what's next for EVC? What is next? Um, pretty much adding support for more cards and expanding the amount of features. Like for example, um, increasing the OCP limit, which is usually programmable, um, mm -hmm. and like load line calibration things like this. Mm -hmm. So like fine tuning for uh, improved overclocking ability, and this is something you can't really. Um, mo like some of these things, they're not modifiable um, by a normal modification. Yeah, that's it's true. like because things uh, are getting more and more integrated into these VRM controllers, and 
It's not as simple to do voltage modifications anymore. From, from an overclocker point of view, would you rather see uh, more development on EVC or um, see uh, hardware vendors make more cards like the Kingpin edition? Because EVJ released a classified Kingpin, uh, the 780 Ti Kingpin edition, which is pretty much fully unlocked. I, we, we compared it earlier to the GTX 275 Lightning card which basically allowed anyone to buy a card and max out the card completely because yeah. everything was available. Um, currently, I think only EVJ really has that card on the market. The other ones are still um, either limited by, by BIOS and then you need to have special connections in the industry or they're just limited by design. So would you rather see EVC, EVC become the, the standard from an overclocker point of view, obviously, or <laughs> rather see more development on, on the actual products and the actual cards? Well, that's, that's a tricky question, right? Um, because the, the manufacturers, they have to conform to whatever policy NVIDIA or AMD uh, goes for when it comes to um, graphics cards. Um, and a lot of people are frustrated with, you know, you have the lightning cards, but you still need special biases, you still need uh, Afterburner Extreme. Uh, you, you still need is, the connections in the Which industry. is like, it's like limited. Um, to like a certain amount of time to constantly have the problem of not having the latest version and stuff like that. So it's like a, lo a lot of time put into just acquiring the tools to actually do the overclocking. Mm -hmm. Which kind of removes the point of having like a card designed for LM2 for sale. Um, but some, something like we suggested to a lot of vendors that, for example, you had for you had the GTX 580 Matrix from ASUS, uh -huh. which actually had soldering points you had to connect uh, to increase the uh, voltage limits, which I think is a really good solution, um, and because it, it automatically it's like voids your warranty, but most overclockers, if you do this for like extreme overclocking, you don't care about that. No, that's true. Um, so I think it's a very good way of. Um, looking at the problem, or like have a, like actual solution for it. So I'm I'm surprised no one else is like continuing to do this. Well, you you're saying it's a GTX 580, right? So the green light program might have been a, an issue there. Yeah. So uh, yeah, I, I think I guess that's that's one of the problems with the industry. There's a there's a, a love hate connection with with overclocking. They like it for 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 marketing, and they like to show how good their product quality is, but they don't want anyone to try and test it out. Exactly. Uh, but exactly. no one has never like seen its products being destroyed or yeah. being you mishandled or sorted everywhere and then nothing works anymore. And you, you can't have the one without the other. Yeah, because well, especially even if you go extreme and start to mod things. Right? Yeah, even when you, do, when you would have just one person dedicated in your company doing the overclocking with a specially bin card, you would upset your, your customer base because they cannot do what you are showing in the in the labs, right? So it's very important to whatever you show is also obtainable by anyone who buys the card. That's why the, 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 the first Lightning cards were so popular. That's why the Kingpin Edition card is so popular. Um, you've worked in the industry for, uh, for a while, um, inside uh, the headquarters even, together with, with uh, engineering teams. What is your experience uh, on this in terms of overclocking and then how it's being treated within multinational companies? All right, so uh, pretty much what, what you uh, what you just said, like overclocking is typically is used for marketing. Um, so the problem is um, for other departments of the company, they don't really care about overclocking. So you have like for example sales, they they don't care about overclocking because well, it's like it's no it's no benefit to them. Um, not not many people will actually buy a card just for overclocking, right? Like you use it for creating some noise about your product. A halo product. Pretty much. Um, and the problem is engineers also, they have so many other issues to work on. They're like, their workload is focused mainly on, you know, maybe sol solving some memory compatibility issues, uh, which is more significant to them than to work on overclocking because overclocking is a very small portion of the, mar of the market. And it requires a lot of work to create a really good product. Yeah. Did you did you uh, experience a lot of frustration at because you've worked you 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 you've been hired or um, the, the company paid you to to be a beta tester to help out with overclocking. So they wanted to invest um, money and resources in this overclocking thing, as we call it. But then you're saying it's not fully supported within the company. Is that 
well, frustrating <coughs> or for for a lot of people it's like the dream job right like if you're an overclocker you want to work with one of the companies just doing overclocking all day right um, but it can get quite frustrating because you're not really part of engineering it depends on the, the company setup right but in a lot of cases you, you won't get included into engineering because all of the companies here are Taiwanese and the engineering team is Taiwanese they only speak Chinese their English is not that good so it's very hard to integrate and um, create a better product together with engineers. They also, as we said before, like they don't really that into overclocking. They, for them, it's mostly trouble. Yeah. Because, oh, you come with these issues, but you know, it's not And it's most not of really the time, you're, you're bringing also There's like issues more, back, right? Yeah. Because you end up yeah, doing more technical marketing and support thing for overclockers exactly, than anything yeah. else, right? Uh, exactly. Guess, uh, and if you just get the product all the time, and you just have to tell every, like, every time you get a product, and you have to give feedback and you just tell, oh, this is wrong, this is wrong, this is wrong, this is not working. It's, it can get quite negative, you know? And you're not really involved in the process. At a certain point, you're just like, well, I just, I'll just do it myself, right? But you don't get any help uh, yeah. trying to improve this product. Yeah, because it's not a priority or... Yeah, for the engineers, purposes. they have like more important things to work on. And, and also, I, I assume it's, um, it's a pride of an engineer to... Because every engineer gets assigned to a certain product, and when something's wrong with it, the, the, the pride of the engineer is going to be, well, I, I want to fix yeah, this. Pretty much, you, you don't want to make them look bad, right? Like yeah. you, you don't want to go in there and do their job because they're going to look bad to your boss and things yeah. like that. So usually, you're like as an overclocker, if you're in, in a company like this, um, it's just, you typically, they're quite big companies. Yep. So you have your position. You're supposed to do this work. You're not supposed to do other work. Yeah. So this is kind of a problem. So if, if you can work around this, like you have in some situations where this actually works, where you have, for example, you have an Asus, you have a Shamina working there, and he speaks Chinese, and he's very well respected in, within the company as well. So he can actually, well, he's pretty much free to do what he wants, and the engineers, they listen to him. And he yeah. Can, yeah. Achieve yeah. great and that, that, I mean, that um, that's a testimony to the great products he's built, right? I yeah. Mean so that's yeah, pretty much it. You also have Nick, Nick Shi, what he did at Ciroc as well. It's like yeah. the difference between when he joined and like after uh, for it's the almost night and, of the, uh, yeah, night and day. Yeah, if you exactly. look at the OC formula exactly. and then what they had before, it's yeah. night and day difference. So for you that experienced uh, the other side where you had uh, this relationship with uh, r and I guess now you're expectations for your future job would be to have that connection with our yeah you, re you, you know you reach a certain point where it's not enough to just you know you don't want to do just do overclocking anymore you actually want to improve the product and do things that matter do, do things do things that are gonna benefit the overclocking community you know mm -hmm. you want you want to help people actually get higher like reach higher frequencies and you know, have like have a better product pretty much, right? even even from a personal challenge point of view in, in the end there is only so much you can do with with records and then you just set different goals for yourself even if when you hit a, the, the limit of let's say a graphics card and you know you can fix something to get a higher score that would be a challenge that you put to yourself and I guess that's more interesting than just chasing chasing the records it's figuring out figuring out when you hit a wall how you can break down that wall and get even further exactly you need, you need to um, keep your motivation um, for, for like um, for your work, can you already shed some light on where where Elmore is going in the near future, <laughs> or is that a big 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 secret? Um, well, it should be okay, but um, I'm probably uh, gonna end up in in Asus um, in the near future. That would be a so great I had, job to I have. I had, had some some good talks with him, and it would be really awesome to to work with Peter. Um, yeah. Right, great. Yeah. So I think that's a that's a bombshell <laughs> where we can end this uh, this episode <laughs> with in, to in, to <laughs> in Top Gear style. Um, so that's yeah, we're that, looking forward on that to bombshell. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> we're looking forward to Competex 2014. We hope to see both Jan and Tim and myself in Taipei at that point, and also hope to see you at the Asia yeah. World OC anniversary. Don't forget to take your seats. Yeah, and, and uh, see you till the next time. Yeah, cheers. <laughs>